It's the world's largest snake, the python. There was a story recently in the newspaper. This is a 16-foot live snake. If you'd like to come up and pet him for a small fee, I'll let you. This was in the newspaper in the New York Times. According to the New York Times, 19-year-old Grant Williams of the Bronx died as a result of an attack by a 13-foot-long Burmese python, which may have taken him as food. So this 19-year-old boy was killed by a snake smaller than this. Hopefully, this one isn't hungry tonight. But did you know that this particular serpent is mentioned in the Bible? Did you know that uh, in the book of Acts, the 16th chapter, there's a story that is centered around midnight. As a matter of fact, if you read it, it talks about it being at midnight, which is always a clue in Scripture of the near coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. At midnight, the bridegroom goes out in the parable Jesus told to meet the bride, which is a picture of the rapture, the second coming of Jesus Christ. So, it says that there was a woman who was possessed with an evil spirit, and the Bible called it the spirit of Python. It's the only time in all the New Testament that the Scripture actually gives the name of a demon in the New Testament. And notice it didn't say it was a spirit of cobra or a spirit of rattlesnake. But it was the spirit <laughs> of python. And I want him to stay confused. Show him the snake, guys. Now listen to me. The scripture said that Paul was preaching and a woman possessed with an evil spirit. We know in the Bible that snakes are a type of demon spirits. For the scripture said in Luke chapter 10 that we would tread on serpents. It wasn't talking about snakes, it was talking about demons. The Bible calls Satan in the book of Revelation that old serpent, the devil. The Bible talks about how in Genesis, how that Satan took the body of a serpent and slithered into the garden. So clearly, serpents are a type in Scripture of demon spirits. And the spirit that is prevailing in the midnight hour, in other words, the prevailing spirit of the end time is a spirit of python. And listen to me carefully. The thing that is so, why would, it, why would it say spirit of python? It means that the same qualities or the same way that the python destroys its victim is the way that the spirit of python in the last days before the coming of Jesus will attack people's lives. You see, the python doesn't kill its victim with a poisonous bite. As a matter of fact, it's not like a rattlesnake or a cobra. It doesn't kill with its venom, but it wraps and coils itself around its victim. And it begins to get a grip around them, and it begins to constrict, and it's after one thing. It's after breath. It squeezes until finally the victim can't <sighs> catch his breath. In the Bible, breath represents the Spirit of God. In John chapter 20, the Bible said Jesus turned and He breathed on His disciples. <sighs> the Scripture said in the book of Acts that there came a mighty rushing wind. Wind filled the upper room, a type of the Holy Spirit. What am I saying to you tonight? The spirit of Python is a spiritual force. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but there is a spiritual force that has the characteristics of a Python, and it's after the breath, the life of God in all of us. When Python wraps himself around an individual, they begin to lose their spiritual life. 
They begin to lose. He begins to choke out the prayer life, choke out the praise life, choke out their consecration to God. And when this spirit gets through with them, they're nothing but a shell. At one time, you can go out, you know, and you can, you can experiment with sin. And that's the thing about a python, is this snake doesn't kill its victims instantly, but it does it gradually, slowly. It goes after its victims. Slowly, it begins to squeeze more and more and more. And that's how sin is. It doesn't... It doesn't seem like it's such a bad thing when you first start, but little by little by little, you begin to lose your spiritual breath, your spiritual life. That's why the Bible said in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 20, it talks about the spirit of Python and his, and his tactics when it says, first he entangles you. He has to call around you and then he overcomes you. And the latter end is worse than the beginning. Listen to me now. Because tonight, we're going to look at some of the greatest superstars the world has ever known. Men and women who had everything the world promises will make you happy and successful. And yet, by the time the spirit of Python was through with them, first they were entangled. At first they could still breathe. At first they still had life and enjoyment. Sin is fun for a season, but it keeps choking the life out of its victim. And the Bible said, once you're entangled, then you're overcome. And the end is always worse than the beginning. Ladies and gentlemen, all the way from Seattle, Washington, please welcome to the stage, Nirvana! Kurt Cobain had everything. He had a movie star wife. He had a beautiful 18-year-old daughter. He had a mansion in Seattle, Washington. He had millions of adoring fans. He could fill coliseums and he lived the rock star life. But something else he had began to destroy his life. He had an alcohol problem. I'm sure that he didn't start out drinking fists of vodka and Jack Daniels. It just started as one beer, one drink, just to, just to relax after a show. And he also had a drug problem. It never starts out a big thing. I'm just going to try it. I'm just going to experiment with it. But once Python entangles you, he begins to squeeze more and more and more. When you first experiment with sin, at first you can come to church and you can still feel God's presence. You still have your breath. You can still breathe. You still feel alive. You can still raise your hands and not feel bad when the worship is going on. But as Python begins to grip more and tighten more you begin to lose that desire for church that desire for spiritual things that desire for life that only Jesus Christ can give and finally Kurt Cobain was swept into a world of hopelessness at the age of 29 he comes home to his mansion in Seattle and he's so low that Python has coiled himself around him so greatly that he begins to pen his own suicide note.
it was four days later that they found the dead body of Kurt Cobain lying in the living room of his mansion in Seattle. There were pills, cocaine, and bottles of alcohol. You see, the Bible said in Proverbs 23 that we should shun alcohol like a poisonous snake. For in the end, it bites like a serpent. It stings like an adder. This past year, I was in South Africa and I stepped outside of my hotel room in, uh, in the national park there that we were. And there was a man standing from the hotel and he said, don't move, back up slowly. And in front of me was a puff adder, the third deadliest snake in the world. And you know what? I didn't pick it up and play with it. I assure you, I backed up carefully. About three weeks ago, I was hunting down in South Georgia and there was a rattlesnake that was five and a half feet long and Benny Sims, a man in the church, and I came upon this snake and I assure you, I didn't reach down and play with him. And yet the Bible says this is just as deadly. This is just as much a killer. I heard a story one time about a man who found a pet rattlesnake that had been run over by a car. It wasn't a pet, but he made it into a pet. It was a, a snake that it was so badly injured it couldn't even lift its head. It couldn't even rattle its rattlers. It was so weak. And so he picked it up and took it in his home and he began to put medicine on it and began to give it water and medicine and take care of it. And one day he reached in and it bit him. And as he was dying, he said, why, Mr. Snake, did you bite me? I helped you. I gave you your life back. I healed you up. And the snake said, you knew I was a snake when you brought me in your home. Don't be surprised if this comes back to bite you. If you end up in a jail cell because you killed somebody or if you end up in a prison cell because you were out of your mind or if you end up pregnant because you got too drunk. For in the end, it bites like a serpent. It stings like an adder. This is not a joke. 36,000 people, mostly teenagers, take their life every year. Sometimes because a boy left her. Sometimes because they feel ugly, they feel unattractive, they don't fit in, nobody will be their friend. And, the, and then comes the hiss of Python. Just take your life. I remember when I heard that hiss at the age of 16 and I was so low at one time in my life that, that Satan whispered to me, you'll never find anybody who will love you. You'll never have anybody who will love you. You're so ugly. You're so unattractive. And I heard the hiss of that spirit of Python said, take your life. You don't have anything to live for. That is that spirit that keeps tightening and sometimes he's hissing through food disorders and sometimes he's hissing saying take your life, take your life through drugs or alcohol or just living a promiscuous life. It got Kurt Cobain and he penned these words. All the, punk warning, all the warnings of Punk Rock 101 courses over the years since my first introduction had proven to be very true. For example, when we were backstage, and listen folks, this is the man who, who, who is supposed to have everything and this is what he says. When the lights would go out and the manic roar of the crowd would begin, it didn't affect me in the way it used to. The fact is I can't fool anyone anymore. The fact is it simply isn't fair to you or me. The worst crime that I can think of is to keep faking it, keep pretending. I'm having 100% fun. 
Sometimes I feel like I've punched in a time clock when I walk out on stage. I've tried everything within my power to appreciate it, but it's empty. Listen to the man who had it all. And some of you would trade your virginity. Some of you would trade everything you know about God just to be popular, just to fit in. And here's the man who had everything you want, but his brains are splattered on the wall. And he says, it's empty. I have a goddess of a wife who sweats ambition, a daughter who reminds me too much of what I used to be, full of joy and love, kissing every person she meets. And he says, that terrifies me to the point that I can barely function. I can't stand the thought of Francis coming, becoming the miserable, self-destructive death rocker that I have become. Thank you for the pit of my nauseous stomach for the letters and concerns during the past years. I don't have the passion anymore. So remember, it's better to burn out than fade away. I'll be with you at the altar, Francis and Courtney. Keep going, Courtney, for Francis, for her life, which will be so much happier without you. First, they are entangled. Just a drink, just a party, just a sexual encounter, and then they're overcome and the end is always worse than the beginning California, ladies and gentlemen California, please welcome to the stage Tupac Shakur Tupac had it all. He had women, he had money, he had fame, he had the mansion in Los Angeles, the Rolls Royce. Notorious B.I.G. had it all. He held, held down the East Coast and he ruled the West Coast and their music flooded the nation and the world. But something began to happen in their life. And if Tupac could come back, he wouldn't he wouldn't sing to you about the thug life. He wouldn't sing to you about drug dealing. If he, if he could be given another chance, he wouldn't call the girls bitches and hoes. If he could come back, he would beg you not to give your virginity away for popularity. He would beg you young men not to waste your life in a game. If he could just come back, he would tell you that the world and the lust thereof fadeth away. 
but he that doeth the will of God shall abide forever. One afternoon, we received a telephone call, call here at the church. It was the wife of, at that time, world heavyweight champion Evander Holyfield. She had watched one of the television programs and she invited my wife and I, Sharice, to their mansion in Atlanta. She showed us around the beautiful mansion that Mr. Holyfield has there and then we went to lunch. She told us the incredible story of how that the night that Tupac was shot, of course her husband, Evander Holyfield, was fighting Mike Tyson in the World Heavyweight Championship. And Tupac had gone to Vegas to watch that fight. And after the fight, she said that her husband, Evander, sat down with Tupac and they were talking and said Evander just felt led to share and witness to Tupac what Christ had done in his life. And he said as he was talking with Tupac, Tupac said in so many words, I know that Jesus Christ is the one. I know that I need to serve him, but not now. Not now. I will one day, but not now. He did not know that Python had already called himself around him, and within a few hours, a drive-by shooting would take place in Vegas. And Tupac would be shot. They would rush him to the emergency room. Go with me into that intensive care unit as an icon, a superstar, a movie star is lying in that deathbed. And if you could see spiritually, you would see a demon like a snake coiling around that bed and around that breathing machine as it's going up and down, up and down, keeping him alive. And finally, <sighs> Tupac, with all of his money and all of his fame, <sighs> takes his last breath and first they are entangled wonder how many of you are already beginning to get entangled already touching things participating in things getting entangled in relationships entangled in worldly things and then you get overcome and the latter end is worse than the beginning it's like I don't care about nothing man Roll another. Yeah. Uh. La da 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 da. La da da da. La da da da. La da da da. La da da da. I was gonna go to class before I got high. Come on, y'all. Check it out. Uh. I could have cheated and I could have passed. But I got high. Uh, uh. La, da, da, I'm taking it next semester, and I know why. Why, <laughs> man? Why? Yeah, hey, cause I got high. Because I got high. Because I got high. Go to the next. Go to the next. Go to the next. Uh. I was gonna go to work, but then I got high. Uh. <laughs> Ooh, I just got a new promotion, but I got high. <laughs> yeah. uh. La, da, 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 now da, da. I'm selling. <laughs> and I know why, why, why hey, hey, cause I got high, because I got high, because I got high. La, 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 la. I won eight gold medals, but then I got high. I had my face on the front of Wheaties, but then I got high. I had a multi-million dollar contract with Kellogg's, but I got high. Why, oh, why, oh, why did I get high? I won four Grammys, but I got high. I don't want to check into rehab, but I got high. I got hair that looks like a beehive, cause I got high. I got high. It doesn't start with a J. It doesn't start with pot. It starts with a cigarette. 
the cigarette is the gateway to all drugs. See, remember, remember the spirit of Python is after your breath. And so one way that he tries to coil himself around our physical bodies is through what we take in through our breath. 370,000 people this year will die of lung cancer. Most of them began smoking when they were just a teenager because it's a gradual thing. At first you can smoke, it's no big deal. But the longer that you smoke, every time you smoke a cigarette, three minutes just came off of your life. These are medical facts. Every time that you smoke a cigarette, you're cutting your life shorter and shorter. It's suicide on the installment plan. But oh, we'll do whatever we want to do to get cool, to look cool. But Python is choking your life away. And one day, he'll come after your breath. I thought about how as destructive as cigarettes are. It's almost like we whitewash marijuana pot, smoking a joint. It's not that big of a deal. After all, the President of the United States said he smoked it, he just didn't inhale. And it's almost like we think it's an innocent drug, but the truth is, listen to me carefully, that there are 10 times the cancer-producing agent in one joint than in cigarettes. In other words, smoking one joint is like smoking 10 packs of cigarettes. Not only that, but... It has been proven that THC, which is the high-producing part of marijuana, kills brain cells. And I've seen some of your report cards, and you don't need to kill any of your brain cells. Once they die, you never get them back. Listen to me. Every other cell in our body recreates itself, but when your brain cells die, you never Get them back. And every time you smoke weed, you're killing brain cells. But there's a greater danger because there's a spiritual force behind drugs. We know this from Revelation chapter 9 where it said they would not repent of their sorcery. And the Greek word for sorcery is pharmadikia from which we get the word pharmacy, drug usage nor their sexual immorality because drugs always go hand in hand with sexual immorality. And so there is a real demon. We wrestle not against flesh and blood for our teenagers. We wrestle not. It's not just a phase they're going through. It is a demonic spirit called the spirit of Python and he wants to entangle and then overcome and then destroy. And the end is worse than the beginning. She was a beautiful model. She was a playboy centerfold. She had everything to live for. Fortune and fame. Power and money. But she couldn't stop drinking. She couldn't stop drugging. The spirit of Python began to literally choke the life out of her. And right before your eyes, you see the 911 call said, we need assistance to the room 607 at the Hard Rock. It's in reference to a white female. She's not breathing. What happened? She was entangled. She was overcome. And the end was worse than the beginning.
His name was Heath Ledger. He was given an Academy Award, the highest, listen now, the highest award Hollywood will give an actor. But he wasn't there to collect it. He was warned by Jack Nicholson about the part in Batman, the Joker. When he heard that, that, that Heath Ledger had taken his life, Jack Nicholson said, I warned him, quote, unquote. He said there was something sinister about the part that Jack Nicholson said when he played the part, something would overcome him and he wouldn't be able to sleep. And he, he went around and he was almost in a tormented state. And he said, I called Heath Ledger and I warned him. But I think his problem began before that. Well, you see, when he decided to play a major part in a movie called Brokeback Mountain that would promote and try to, to legitimize homosexuality in our nation. Listen to me. Listen, please. The same year that Brokeback Mountain won every award Hollywood could offer it, The Passion of the Christ was released. Mel Gibson's Passion of the Christ did not get one award from Hollywood, but Hollywood said, Brokeback Mountain deserves all of our praise, all of our honor. But what does God's Word say about it? In Romans chapter 1, this is what God says. Therefore, God gave them over. Everybody say, gave them over. You see, there's a place in sin, particularly sexual sins. If you insist, if you keep trampling over the blood of Jesus, if you keep saying no to your conscience, if you keep sleeping and committing immorality and fornication and even homosexuality, there comes a point where even God backs off. And he says, I still love you, but I'm going to give you over to the lifestyle you're demanding. And he gave them over to sinful desires of their hearts for sexual impurity, for degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God. Listen, you had the passion of the Christ the same year. Brokeback Mountain came out and Hollywood said, we don't want the truth of God. We'd rather have our lie. And they worshiped and served and created things rather than the creator. Next verse. Because of this, here it is again. God gave them over to shameful lust. Even their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. I kissed a girl and I liked it. The taste of her cherry chapstick. I kissed a girl just to try it. I hope my boyfriend don't mind it. It felt so wrong. It felt so right. Don't mean I'm in love tonight. I kissed a girl and I liked it. Listen to these words. I want them to put it up carefully. Because you see, there is a demon that is promoting homosexuality in our nation, trying to redefine what marriage is. And there's a generation that's weak enough, that's been indoctrinated enough to accept it. This is the words. Listen, this young lady, her name is, is Katy Perry. Her father is a Pentecostal preacher. And this is the words to her song, this was never the way I planned, not my intention. I got so brave, drinking hand, lost my discretion. It's not what I'm used to, just want to try you on. I'm curious for you. Of course, she's singing to another woman. Caught, you've caught my attention. I kissed a girl and I liked it. The taste of her cherry chapstick. I kissed a girl just to try it. I hope my boyfriend doesn't mind. Next verse quickly. It felt so wrong. It felt so right. Don't mean I'm in love tonight. I kissed a girl and I liked it. I liked it. I liked it. I liked it. This became the number one song in the United States of America pop charts about girl on girl love. Her mother didn't like it. These are the exact words when she was interviewed. Her mother said, heartbroken, I hate the song. 
It clearly promotes homosexuality. Its message is shameful and disgusting. Kathy knows how I feel. Kathy is our daughter and we love her, but we strongly disagree with how she's conducting herself at the moment. We cannot cut her out of our lives. She is our child. She knows we disagree strongly with what she is doing. And the message she is promoting regarding homosexuality, which is the Bible, which the Bible clearly states is a sin. We're very outspoken family. She knows how disappointed her father and I are. I can't even listen to the song. Listen to her mother now. The first time I heard it, I was in total shock. When it comes on the radio, I bow my head and pray the scripture said he gave them over I want to talk to somebody in this room tonight from everything that is within me if you keep giving yourself to that pornography, if you keep having that secret affair, if you keep sleeping with that boy, sleeping with that girl, doing those sexual things, there will come a point when the Holy Spirit will back off and give you over. There's no protection. There's no grace there. You're on Satan's turf. He can inflict AIDS. He can inflict disease. He can inflict pain that will never leave your life. Hear me. Hear me. At first you become entangled. And then you're overcome. You can't stop anymore. And the end is worse than the beginning. No, no, no. I said he's so sweet. I wanna let the rapper. So I let it pierce. to go right now they've got the green light you see the Bible said in Matthew 6 22 that your eye is the mirror to your soul if your eye has filled with light it fills your body with light but if your eye is filled with darkness filth filth X-rated porn sites. What you take in affects you because you see, you have 100 million receptors in your eye. It's capable of looking at something and bringing your brain 4 million bytes of information in 187,000 seconds, 187,000 miles per second blowing it up into 3D and it creates a picture in your head. You are a visual being. That's why when you hear a word, you see a picture. For example, giraffe, you just saw one. Black dog, white horse. Why? Because we are visual beings and in the moment we hear a word, our brain paints the picture. That's why you have to know that if Satan is going to destroy a life, he must first get a grip on the thought life of the, of the person he's going to destroy. The sexual encounter doesn't begin in the bedroom. It do, the green light isn't given in the back seat of the car. It begins in the thought life. And private thoughts lead to public actions. 
what you're feeding your mind on privately. See, Python wants to get a tight grip on your thought life. And it's not just visual pornography. But what about musical pornography? What about lollipop? I make her feel right when it's wrong like lying. Man, she ain't never had a love like mine. And I'm not even going to repeat that. Get the right verse, guys, now. This is the course of this song. She, she licked me like a lollipop. She, she licked me like a lollipop. She, she licked me like a lollipop. And I want you to see this. Kids going around with their headsets, feeding their mind, 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 feeding their mind. Then when they get to the party, that demon is getting stirred up, stirred up, stirred up, stirred up, stirred up, and it's feeding Python. And before you know it, they're in a bedroom and Python whispers if you'll give him what he wants you'll be popular he'll love you remember this lust gives a condom love gives a wedding and there's a big difference there's a big difference there's a big difference See, the enemy wants to wrap us up in the wrong relationships. Chris Brown and Rihanna look like the perfect couple. But there's one problem. They're living together without Jesus in the middle of that relationship. And you can't know what love is without Jesus. I don't care how popular you are. I don't care how famous you are. This is the picture Hollywood wants you to see. It's all right to sleep together before marriage, but this is the picture Satan never wants you to see. This is the picture of sin. This is the picture of what demons do. And he'll show you the picture of the popular couple at school. And the rumor is they're sleeping together, but he'll never show you the picture of the bloody abortion clinic. He'll never show you the picture. He'll never show you the picture of the sexually transmitted disease. He'll never show you the picture of the girl being dumped by the same guy who used her. And now she's ready to blow her brains out. That's the spirit of Python. You see... I'm believing and I'm praying tonight as I close this message that it'll be more than a sermon, but it'll be something deep inside of everyone hearing me that you will say it's time for the old me to die. You see, T.I. is going to prison this week. He's one of the most popular rap artists in the world. But he's going to prison, but he wrote a song and the song talks about his, all of the stuff that he's been promoting. The thug life, drugs, promiscuity, living wild and free. But he said, before I get to prison, I've already made a change. And he said, I want to announce to the world I was wrong. And I want to announce to the kids that I've sung to I was wrong. And he said, the old T.I. is dead and gone. This is my tombstone. One day you're going to have one. Kurt Cobain has one. Tupac has one. Notorious B.I.G. has one. Anna Nicole Smith has one. And they're going to put your name. And they're going to put the date that you were born. And then I made them make this out so that I would be 100 when I die. They're going to put the date that you die. But in the middle... They're going to put a dash. You can't control the day you were born and you can't control the day that you die, but you can define what your dash represents. 
Is that all you're living for? Popularity? Is that all you're living for? Why don't you make your dash count? Why don't you say, Lord, here's my life. Here's my talents. Here's my future. Here's my relationships. Take this dash, this thing called life, and let the old me die. Let me leave this place tonight and let the old me be dead and gone. We rewrote this song. And I want you to listen carefully to these words. And I pray it happens to people in this room tonight. I was a child. I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. When I became a man, I put away my childish things. Check it. So, hey. I Down to sleep, the old me's dead and gone away I took that step to be a man and killed my pride so unashamed Wonder what I would be if I had never took the leap Probably so lost in the world that I end up dead out in these streets Now I walk by faith in the dreams what I chase And have my head towards the sky cause all I need is his grace And I stay to my knees and thank God every day For every blessing I receive through it, my life has been changed yeah. Traveling on the school 
Stand to your feet, no one moving, every head bowed, every eye closed. These guys have been fasting and praying. We checked out every one of them and made sure they live the life. They're going to go with me to New York City and do this at a coliseum in New York City. They're going to go with me Friday night. This young man that played Tupac told his boss, he said, I hope I can keep my job, but he said, I got to do this for the Lord because God's done so much for me. I just believe God's going to honor that in his life, don't you? They've been praying backstage. And I want the whole crew to come out. If you were involved in this, I want you out on the stage. Just bow your head for just one moment. Holy Spirit, we need you right now to take every illustration and drive it home. Somebody needs to swallow that pill they call pride and bow their knee and confess you as their Lord and get untangled, catch the breath back, come alive again in Jesus. They're entangled, God. Don't let them get any deeper. Don't let Python's grip get any greater. Tonight is the night. This is the moment. This is the place for a turnaround. This is where the old you needs to be dead and gone. Forever. And if you're in this room tonight and you would say, Jensen, you're talking to me. Is everyone in this room who's a Christian, I want you praying right now. But if you're in this place and you would say, I'm not right with God and I'm not going to play games. I know I need to get right with God and I want to give Him a chance in my life. I don't want the spirit of Python to destroy my life. Take my life. Take my walk with God. I'm ready tonight for His love and His grace, the Lord Jesus Christ, to wash me and cleanse me and set me free. Pray for me. That's you quickly raise your hand right where you're standing. I want to see it there, there, there. Raise it high, raise it high, raise it high. I want to see those hands. If you can bring the lights up, I want to see these hands all over the building. Raise them high and unashamed. Don't be ashamed of him. Don't be ashamed of him. That's it. Raise them high, raise them high. Raise them high, raise them high. Every one of you that have your hand raised, quickly get out of your seat and come stand right down here. Just as quick as you can move. Don't talk yourself out of it. The moment you move, Python's grip is going to break. The moment that you move, the power of the serpent is going to be defeated in your life. I don't care if you've got a drug problem. I don't care what kind of shame you've been in. I don't care if the enemy has told you you're, you're not important and you even need to take your life. This is a night where God is going to breathe on you. Life, peace, health, strength. He loves you. I don't care what you've done. I don't care if you've messed up. I don't care how bad you failed. He loves you. Hear that overriding everything we preach tonight. Maybe you're struggling with homosexuality. We love you. God loves you. You don't have to struggle alone anymore. Somebody can help you. Somebody can love you. Somebody can, can take you by the hand and say, you're going to make it. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Get out of that seat, come on. That pornography is choking your marriage to death. Get out of that seat, get out of that seat. This is your night, this is your night. This is your night. Just lift your hands up in worship now. Sing it. I'm waiting just another moment because I sense there are many more that need to get out of their seat. Some of you are entangled and you know it. Entangled in an affair. Entangled in immorality. Entangled in private secret things. You're fooling your parents but you're not fooling God. He brought you here tonight. Come. Come. Get out before it's too late. Come on. Come on. 
Come on. Sing that, please. There's no other name by which I am saved. Lift your hands up and worship Him. Just a moment. The Lord is Capture doing something. Worship Him. Worship Him. Say, Lord, I surrender my oh, life to you tonight. You, God, I want to be dead and gone. The old me. The lies, the deceit, the double life. Where I don't want to do it anymore. I want to know who you are, Jesus. Go. There's no other In the name of Jesus, I unwrap you from relationships, friendships that are pulling you down. Some of you are running with the wrong crowd and I unwrap you in those ungodly relationships. In the name of Jesus, walk away, says the Lord. Walk away and I'll guide you. Walk away and I'll use you. Walk away and I'll bless you. You don't need them in your life. Be who God's called you up to be unapologetically, unashamed. If you have to stand alone, stand alone. He'll stand with you. Everyone in this room, stretch your hand this way, guys. I want you to go down off this platform and I want you to find somebody to lay your hand on their shoulder and pray for we're going to pray a prayer together right now. Praise God. No more alcohol. That person is dead and gone. No more drugs. No more cigarettes. No more nasty music. No more. That's dead and gone. Shout it. It's dead and gone. It didn't make you happy. It didn't make you feel. There's pleasure in sin only for a season. Then it'll turn. Then it'll turn. Pain, hurt, sorrow, tears, shame. Shame. And only Jesus can give you the power to start again. I don't want you to feel like if you've messed up, there's no hope. Because that's this is why Jesus came. I, I was getting ready, and I don't mean to just go on. But I was getting ready, and... <laughs> I started, you left me that CD of our new CD and I started listening to the power of the cross and then Israel started singing the song about the blood. Uh, what is it that he sings? The, the, the blood song. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, oh. It can take away the shame, the guilt, the pain. You can, you can truly leave this place. Listen. Why shares white as snow. Sing it, everybody. 
Pray this prayer with me out loud. Say these words from your heart. He's been waiting, patiently waiting for this moment. Lord Jesus, I give you my life. Tonight, the old me is dead and gone. Through your blood, I am born again. I receive your forgiveness. Thank you for a brand new start. From this night forward, I'm going to make my dash count. I'm going to glorify you with my dash. I'll never be ashamed of you. And I thank you for calling me your own. I'm forgiven. Praise the name of Jesus. Oh, give him a great praise to him. Give him a great praise to him. Give him a great praise to him. Woo! Let's give him a great praise. Hallelujah. Oh! Reach over and lay your hand on somebody and say, Receive you the Holy Ghost. You need to get the Holy Ghost. Receive you the Holy Ghost. Oh! The Just one moment. I want everybody just to stay right where you are. And I want to ask you a question. Do you think that we can touch some souls in Knoxville? There will be 20 plus thousand teenagers there. We've been invited by Ron Luce Ministry. Um, Teen, chat, teen mania, teen mania, to take this message to New York City, in the Coliseum there, and and speak to uh, 13, close to 15,000 teenagers. To do that, to pay the airfare, the hotel, all of that, it's going to cost us about ten thousand dollars. Would you help invest in these kids' lives because they're going to get touched? You can't you can't reach others and it not impact you. But then on top of that, you will send us to reach these kids. Together, well over 30,000 in person. This doesn't include the DVDs that will be sold. Spirit of Python is our number one. The old Spirit of Python is the number one seller of this ministry. We have sold tens of thousands. They have played them in churches for church services, youth services. We have given rights to other ministries to take the message and duplicate it and use it. And God only knows. And now, seven years later, we're revamping and bringing it back. And it could be that, that the latter is greater than the former. How many of you believe we could reach more than we've ever reached? So will you help us? Normally, we don't take two offerings. 
But I want to do this because I need these kids to go. I need this team to go with me to, uh, to Knoxville and to New York City. And if you would like to be a part of that, maybe you've got a teenager or grandchild. Why don't you sow a seed for them? I'm not going to tell you what to give. Just anything you can do. If everybody does a little something, it'll be more than enough to meet this need. And we'll use the rest in youth ministry if it's anything over it. But I don't, you know, that's about 10000 each that, that it's going to cost us. And so we need your help. We need your help. Hallelujah. Thank you. Ushers, come when you're ready. I'm so proud of you guys coming forward. I'm so proud of you guys giving your heart to the Lord. Tell everybody you can. Now, don't be quiet about it. Tell everybody you can. I've surrendered my life to say the old me is dead and gone. The ushers are coming right now. They're going to serve you. He's going to lead us in one more song, and then we're going to be dismissed. If you'd like to get this DVD, um, when will it be ready, Brian? Tonight? Is it tomorrow? <laughs> Take the night off. That's okay. You did a great job, by the way. Tell our video department, our light department, Tracy Page, uh, the youth department, Clay and all the guys. What an amazing, amazing presentation. All of these actors. Would you tell all of these actors and rappers, and they're using their gift. They could be in a club, but they're using their gift for Jesus. I love it, don't you? God bless you guys. The ushers are coming. If you'll just be patient, just about 60 more seconds, it'll make the difference in sending this message to reach 30 plus thousand teenagers in the next few weeks. We appreciate it so very much. Sunday, you must bring somebody with you to church. You must not come here by yourself. You must bring someone. I'll be preaching in the 9 o'clock, in the 11 o'clock, the 1.30. You must be in church Sunday and bring somebody with you. Don't miss it for anything. We love you. Pray for us Friday night. We'll be doing this in Knoxville, Tennessee. Friday night, say a special word of prayer for your young people here that are preaching the gospel Friday night. We love you. May the Lord bless you. Thank you so much for your generosity. Thank you. When chains are gone, I've been set free.